Thank you for walking with us through all the things. We ask for your, your blessing over this morning. We ask for just your, uh, your spirit to refresh us, Lord. Lead us. Open our hearts. Open our minds to understand your word and to apply it directly and correctly. Thank you for all you're doing. In Jesus' precious name we all pray. Amen. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, I have two more announcements, and I'll, I'll have to sort of come up here so we can pray over them as a church. Uh, the first announcement is the Young Men's Discipleship that I'm going to be doing. That starts next Thursday. So if you haven't signed up for it yet, there's sign-ups outside as well as on the church app. And I think we're going to be meeting at the Dodge House. Ashley's giving me a thumbs up. All right, so yeah, we're going to be meeting at the Dodge House next Thursday at 6.30, and so it's just going to be a, a more practical discipleship for young men that I'm going to be leading, and uh, we're accepting ages from middle school all the way to early college age. And then the final announcement I have is the book club, which I haven't forgotten about. We're going through East of Eden, which is my all-time favorite book. We had the first half uh, a couple weeks ago. We're going to do the second half in October, so if you haven't read the book, you got a whole month you got a whole month to do it. It's only 600 pages. It'll take you a good afternoon, and you'll be, you'll be all set. So if you want to do that, that's, uh, that's going to be sometime in October. We don't have an official date yet. But that being said, I'd like to call up Aaron and Priscilla. I'm trying to find them. There they are. Cool. So Aaron and Priscilla have been helping us out since we started the church, and they have an area of their life that they would like to share with you guys as well as receive prayer about. But basically... Um, Aaron here is, uh, he has a nephew, brand new nephew from his brother, and there's a whole history behind that. If you want to, if you want to share a little, you can. If not, yeah. So, yeah, so my brother has a history of drug addiction. My brother actually he had a kid. The kid was unfortunately born with five different drugs in the system. So immediately when the kid was born, was just taken straight into the system. <clears throat> He's with a good foster family right now, but obviously we're next of kin, so we're trying to start the process. But we just know it's going to be a tough road. The like my brother and his family kind of know we're going to be difficult to deal with. We just kind of, we know we're going to be walking into a storm, spiritual warfare, um, but we know God is with us. But yeah, we would, I asked Peter to pray with us because we need all the prayer that we could get just for discernment, wisdom, um, and we're, we're praying that he doesn't go back to my brother's family because we just know a year, six months down the line or whatever, he's just going to go right back to how it's gone in the past. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, that's about it. If you guys have any questions or thoughts, we'd love to hear them. Yeah. Not right now. After service. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you guys come over here. So we're, we're called in the Bible to pray for one another because we are members of the same body. So when one member suffers, we all suffer. And when one member is exalted, we are all exalted together. So let's lift you guys up in prayer. Uh, so Lord, we know that your heart is for widows and orphans, those who are helpless and those who are without the resources that some of us have been very graciously blessed with. So Lord, I, I, I applaud Aaron and Priscilla and their desire in their heart to raise young Malcolm, to adopt him into their family, to raise him as one of their own. Uh, we know that he's already had a rough go of it just uh, off the bat. So I pray that you would make this transition as easy as possible and please equip and give wisdom and discernment to Aaron and Priscilla to raise this child in a way that honors and glorifies you. I pray that they would be able to be prepared for the added difficulties and strain that will come upon their family and their children, that they would be able to navigate those well, that their marriage would actually grow and become more prosperous as a result of this decision. But we know that there are a lot of difficulties ahead. and We don't know what those are, Lord, but you are aware. So we pray that they would handle them step by step and day by day together as a couple. We love you so much, Lord. We lay this issue into your hands. 
and through your son we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank, thank you, guys. You. Yeah. All right, so if you have your Bibles, you can flip them open to Genesis chapter 18. And uh, I'm going to read the first couple verses of it. We'll, we'll read a couple more verses down the road here, but we're, I'm mainly going to summarize this chapter for you guys. So in Genesis 18, starting in verse 1, it says this, Then the Lord appeared to him by the terebinth trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the ground and said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by on your servant. Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet. Rest yourself underneath the tree, and I will bring a morsel of bread, and you may refresh your hearts. After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. And they said, Do as you have said. So this is a very weird chapter. It's a very strange chapter. You have three angelic figures showing up at the house of Abram, Abraham now, actually. And this is right after Abraham has had his conversation with God, in which God has reestablished the covenant that he had with him and given him the sign of circumcision. Now, we're not really sure how long it was between chapter 7 and chapter 18, but it seems like it was pretty short. It seems like it was uh, maybe within a week or two of what we just read in Genesis 17. And in this passage, these three individuals come to Abraham. He feeds them food, which is weird because they're spiritual beings. Sarah makes them a little bit of bread. Then they start to reiterate to Abraham, and one of them, by the way, he overhears this conversation and she starts to laugh because she's like, that's ridiculous, that couldn't happen. She says, I'm past the time of bearing, which if you don't know what that is, ask your parents later. I'm past the time of bearing and Basically, it's just not going to happen for me, so she chuckles. And then God, knowing that she's listening, says, why did you laugh? And she's like, oh, I would never laugh at a promise of the Lord. And he's like, yeah, but you kind of did. And then that conversation transitions. Then they have an in-depth conversation about God's future judgment of Sodom. Those of you guys who have been with us in the Genesis story know that Lot, Abram's, Abraham's nephew, moved into a really wicked neighborhood called Sodom near another city, very famous, named Gomorrah. And God is telling Abraham, these two cities have conducted themselves in such a way that they are demanding divine judgment. And because of that, I am going to wipe them out. But I want you to know about it because I have chosen to make you a great nation within the area. So then Abraham engages in a very, it's very weird, like I said, he engages in some bartering with God, about how many people God can save. And he starts with 50, and then he goes down to 45, and then 40, and then all the way down to 10. And God agrees with him. He says, if I find 10 innocent people, righteous people within the city, I will actually spare the whole city. So then they kind of shake hands on the deal, and then the angels go. And if you read in the next chapter, chapter 19, what happens is one angel goes up onto a mountain overlooking the city, and this is the person that we believe to be Jesus Christ. The other two go into the city, and basically the men of the city threaten to violently oppress or hurt these men. Lot invites them into his house. He protects them for a time, and then he uses some unsavory methods to try to do it, which we'll talk about more next week. But the angels end up striking the men blind, and then they pull Abraham and his family outside of the city and then judge it, right? They level it to the ground with fire, and brimstone. So as I said, it's a very strange story, but basically what this narrative account does for us is it teaches us one of the most important virtues in the Bible, one that we are sorely lacking in our culture. It is the virtue of hospitality. And in fact, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment in the entire Bible was, he said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He says that upon that, all of the law and all of the prophets reside. And then this principle of hospitality becomes so important, this story that we just kind of went over very quickly, becomes such a vital component for the people of Israel that later on in the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews makes this statement very frivolously. He says, verse 1 of chapter 13, says, let brotherly love continue, and do not forget to entertain strangers. 
For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the same body also. Again, it's a very frivolous statement that we would like more information on. Like, what do you mean that we can be treating a stranger and it might be an angel? That sounds kind of radical. How does that work? What is going on here? But once we understand Genesis 18 and 19, we realize that he is referencing this story. He's referencing this time where Abraham unwittingly invited three angelic beings into his home and served them a meal. This concept of hospitality then becomes so vital for the Jewish people and for the Christian people after them that it becomes, like I said, the cornerstone of our whole moral framework. And we're going to be going through the text of Scripture to show this because of how valuable and important it is. So today what we're going to be focusing on is what is hospitality? Why is it so important to God? Why does he emphasize it so much throughout his word? And how do we get it? How do we grow in this incredible virtue that, as I said, has been largely forgotten or lost in the current culture that we live in? So let's begin with the first part. What is hospitality? So the word hospitality in Greek comes from two words kind of mashed together. It's words philo and xenos. Philo is the word for brotherly love. If you've been to the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, that's where that word comes from. Brotherly love or brotherly affection. Xenos, if you've ever heard of xenophobia, is the stranger. So you put those two words together, what is it? It's brotherly affection or considering as kin the stranger the one outside the tribe, the person who you don't have familial relationships with, kinship relationships with, and yet you still treat them as if you do. It is the love for the stranger. And as I said, upon this one virtue, all other virtues are constructed. And don't just take my word for it. This is the word of Jesus. Matthew 5, verse 43 through 48. Jesus is going over the very famous Sermon on the Mount where he's laying for us the ideals of virtue, what it means to be godly, to really reflect the character of God. And this is what he says, You have heard that it is said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise upon the just and the unjust, the evil and and the good. For if you love those who love you in return, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do, this, do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Notice that at the end. If you could do this, if you could love the stranger, you will be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So right off the bat, we should all know, none of us do this, right? So if you didn't know that already, none of us actually do this. But Jesus is saying, this is what we should be shooting for. If you could actually have affection, genuine affection, on the stranger, on the person to whom you do not owe love, you will become more and more like your father. But you also see that this is not a common virtue. This is not something that the pagan nations prior to Christ taught. They actually taught the opposite. Notice, even the Jewish people had forgotten what this virtue was all about because a common saying of Jesus' day was what? You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. They're like, yes, love your neighbor as yourself. But neighbor means literal neighbor, right? He's talking about the dude down the street. He is not talking about the guy across the border, right? He's not talking about these people outside of my next of kin. They're only talking about the people within my kin. Pagan tribalism is the norm of human society. That we have a tribe to which we owe honor and glory, but everyone outside of the tribe, we don't owe anything. That is the norm of human culture and human society. It was a really radical concept that Jesus is introducing here. Well, the Jewish people prior, and then Jesus reaffirming in the New Testament that loving the stranger, loving the enemy, is actually at the pinnacle, or even the foundation and all the way up the pinnacle to the pinnacle of human virtue. That hospitality is everything. Why? 
because it is reflective of the nature of God. Notice what he says. God lets the sun rise on the evil and the good, and he lets the rain fall on the just and the unjust. He's saying that God is so loving to the stranger who we are. (laughs) Mankind as a species is a stranger to God. And yet God is so loving to us that he will even do good to those who hate him, not just those who have converted to him. C.S. Lewis once famously said that God is a unique individual in that he uniquely creates his own parasites. In other words, like he creates man, and man is a parasite on the love of God. We actually mistreat the good things of God. We destroy his earth. We destroy his blessings. And yet God loves us anyway. And in fact, he invites so much of our oppression upon himself that he even invites into himself human judgment. That he allows himself to be born as a man. He allows himself to live in our corrupt societies. And he allows himself to be judged by the unjust laws of those societies and die on our behalf. That's how much God loves the stranger. It is a divine attribute that shines from day one of the creation all the way until the final judgment. And it actually is the thing that upholds the crucifixion narrative as a whole. It may sound weird, but it it is the most important virtue that we can understand. And in fact, God seems to judge nations on this basis. God actually judges individuals and whole nations on the basis of whether or not they love the stranger. This happens in Genesis 19. Abraham invites in the stranger and he loves the angels and they give him a blessing. The men of Sodom, who God had already said are bad, the way that they treat the stranger or attempt to treat the stranger becomes a metric by which God judges them. In Matthew 23, Jesus says this is the metric that God is going to judge the nations when he returns. He says to some people, you'll separate, it says in the, you can read the passage on your own time. Uh, Matthew 23, verse 34 through 45, Jesus says that he will separate out the sheep and the goats, and he will put the sheep on one hand and the goats on the other, and he will ask them, and he will say, for when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you didn't give me water. When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. And they say, Lord, Lord, when were you hungry and we didn't feed you? When were you thirsty and we didn't give you water? When were you in prison and we did not visit you? And he says, I say unto you that when you did not do these things to the least of these, my brethren, you did not do them unto me. And to the faithful, to the sheep, he says the opposite. He says, when I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. When I was in prison, you visited me. And they said, when did we see this, Lord? He says, For when you did these things to the least of these, my brethren, you did them unto me. Abraham's willingness, because it it seems weird. It's like, why would God disguise himself as a human being and the angels as human beings? Why wouldn't they show up in their glory and show themselves in power to both Abraham as well as to the nation of Sodom? It's because the way that you treat strangers is directly reflective of your character. God judges numerous pagan nations on this basis. And in fact, he judges them specifically for how they treat his people, Israel. Why? Because Israel is like the ultimate stranger. They're the ultimate people that have been devoid of a homeland for numerous, numerous centuries. And the way that a nation treats the Israelite is usually how God judges them as a whole. When a nation has become too corrupt, they usually start to persecute the Israelites, the Jews in their midst. And it's a symbol of the fact that they have lost this virtue of hospitality. That they do not show the stranger good, but instead they are showing the stranger evil. Now, another thing that you notice is that God judges Israel for how they treat the stranger as well. So when Israel fails to do this, he usually says, you have shed innocent blood. What he means is that, well, there's a specific connotation to that of how they treated their children. But what God is also saying is that you have failed to love the stranger. Who's the stranger? The poor, the powerless, the voiceless, the widow, the orphan, the people that have no voice within the society. You have not shown them grace, and so therefore you will not be shown grace. This is also so significant to even the birth of Jesus. If you've ever wondered why Luke includes in his narrative the fact that there was no room at the inn 
for Mary. It's because that's what had happened to that culture at the time. They weren't ready to receive the stranger. They had no love for the stranger, and so Jesus is born in a manger. It's a, it's a picture of how that nation had seen the stranger over the years. They were not loving the stranger. They were only loving themselves. Now, another big problem is what Jesus says is that you might start loving yourself, but the circle of what constitutes your tribe will only go in one direction. Meaning the second you shut off love to the stranger, your love for what you consider your neighbor becomes more and more restrictive over time. So Jesus is asked the very obvious question during one of his sermons where he's emphasizing this point. Someone says to him, well, then who is my neighbor? And we're given a little uh, indicator here that this man asked the question to justify himself. Right? In other words, he knew, like, I'm not loving the stranger. But he's like, well, who is my neighbor? I do love the guy next to my street. What's his face? You know, like, I, I do love people in my family, so aren't I good? And Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And the whole point of that story is that a Jew is beaten and abused and left on the side of the road, and who passes him first? The religious elite. And I think it's Charles Spurgeon who said that the rabbi and the priest, when they're pass, passing him, he says, I'm sure the rabbi was praying when he passed the Samaritan, and I'm sure the priest was reading the Torah, but both of them failed to accomplish what they were supposed to. Right? The stranger, the one with that power, left on the side of the road, who was their fellow countryman. They didn't have the time to help. But who helps him? The Samaritan, the outsider, the person who was not a part of the Israelite tribe, helps him. What Jesus is saying is, who is my neighbor? Your neighbor are all those who are made in the image and likeness of God. All those to whom God does good to, those are the ones you're supposed to do good to. God is being very, very clear and obvious that when you shut your heart to the stranger, you begin to shut your heart even to your own family. This is seen, I think, most clearly in the nation of Egypt. Right? The nation of Egypt in the book of Genesis, we'll get there in a year or two, and the book of Genesis at the end, the nation of Egypt invites the Israelites into their nation, and they do good. They, they give them their own little city. They provide for them. They take care of them. There's a beautiful welcoming of the stranger that happens at the end of the book. But as Exodus comes along, the nation becomes more and more corrupt, and then they start perverting justice to the stranger. They turn the stranger into slave labor. They start persecuting and oppressing the Israelites. And they could justify, you could see the Pharaoh saying, like, well, I'm just valuing my people above any others. That's why I'm doing this. But what happens is God starts lowering the booms of justice upon the Egyptians. Eventually, one of his aides has to come to him, and he says in verse 7 of chapter 10, Do you not yet know that Egypt is destroyed? What is he saying? He's like, you claim that you're doing all this for us, yet your stupid policies are destroying your own people. Do you really care about us, or do you really care about you? You valued yourself so much that you are the only person who you consider your own neighbor. As a culture becomes more corrupt, they become more oppressive, not just to others, but even to themselves. Even to themselves, they start to persecute members of their own nation because they don't have love for the stranger. And we're the same way. The more isolated you and I become, the less loving we become to others outside of ourselves, the less loving we become in general, to the point where we don't love anyone except for ourselves. And even then, our love for ourselves is a bit tentative. Now, there are a couple reasons as to why this is such an important metric for the soul, some of which we've already gone over, but let's push this point a little bit further. Let's talk about why virtue is predicated upon loving the stranger. Well, the voice of God is the voice of a stranger. And so therefore, the one who heeds the voice of God is the one who can heed the voice of the stranger. The one who can't is the one who won't. This is Proverbs 18, verses 1 through 2. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. For a fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. 
How many people say that they want to hear from God? I want to hear from God. I don't think I've ever heard of anyone who doesn't want to hear from God. Like, I don't want to know what God thinks about that. I just want to do my own thing. Everyone wants divine guidance. Everybody wants to feel as though what they're doing is in accordance with God's will. People will pay big money to figure out what God's will is, and they will go to many unsavory sources to figure it out. Everybody says they want to hear the voice of God, but here's the thing. Do we really? Do we really want to hear the voice of God, or do we simply want divine validation for what's already in our own heart? To put it another way, what makes you think that the God of the universe would agree with you? If you're really looking for the voice of God, what makes you think that when He speaks to you, you're going to like what He has to say? Very often in the Bible, God doesn't tell people what they want to hear. In fact, I defy you to find me a moment in the Bible where God sees fit to tell someone something and they receive the message because it totally accords with what they wanted. Many good people receive it with joy, but almost never will the message accord with what people want. That's why so many people run away from the voice of God. The person who has no room in their heart to love the stranger is also the person who has no room in their heart to receive a voice that contradicts their own. They only have room for the people that they trust. I think Shakespeare got this right. Uh, in one of his more famous plays, he wrote King Lear, which is a hard play to read, by the way, because it's Shakespeare. But in King Lear, you have a king who's become corrupt. And instead of looking to counsel from those who would actually tell him the truth, he basically tells his daughters, I will give land to the one who loves me the most. And so his deceptive daughters trick him into thinking that they love him more than the others. And the only good daughter says, I will not inflame your ego, good king. And he curses her and doesn't give her any land. Down the road, he ends up losing his sanity. And the only person who's willing to tell the truth to the king is the court jester. When you shut your heart to the truth and you only accept truths that you like, don't be surprised when all you hear all day, every day is lies. If you want to hear truth, though, you have to actually hear the voice of the stranger. You have to actually go outside of your tribe and maybe hear what other people are saying. Because maybe people outside of your cultural milieu, the people who agree with you about everything, maybe they have something to say. And maybe you don't want to hear it because your, vo your ears are shut off to the voice of the stranger. Now, this is unfortunately the trap that Sarah has fallen into. Now, she does it in a funnier way. I've already told you what she does, and it's okay. Kids are the voice of the stranger, you know? They, <laughs> they tell us what we don't want to hear. But at any rate, um, Sarah, I've already told you what she, she does and how she reacts, right? She hears the word that she doesn't want to receive, that she can't believe, and she laughs. Now, God plays it cool, right? He, he makes it into kind of a comedic moment. But you notice there's, there's part of this story. It seems almost insignificant but it actually carries a heavy amount of significance. When Sarah laughs at the message of the Lord, the message of the stranger, you notice that they receive the offering of Abraham, but they don't receive hers. Abraham makes them food. Sarah makes them cakes. They eat the food. They don't eat the cakes. So it's almost as if, again, your heart being shut off to these things actually turns the voice of God away from you if you're not careful. Now, she gets kind of a slap on the wrist. It's a very light rebuke. But it does show Sarah's heart in general. For we have to remember, it was Sarah who abused Hagar, who was the stranger in her home. So even though Sarah has a lot of good qualities, she also has this negative quality. She doesn't have room in her heart for the stranger. Abraham, on the other side of the equation, he has his faults and flaws, but he also exemplifies this virtue quite well. You'll notice that he does invite in the stranger. He does raise Ishmael. He does try to treat Hagar correctly. He does fight even for his nephew Lot when his nephew Lot is doing nothing but screwing up. Abraham, when he's wrong, he's corrected quite quickly, actually. And in fact, some of the times that he receives correction, it's from the stranger. It's from somebody who, let's be real, should not be listened to. So in two different occasions in his life, he goes to Egypt and he hides the identity of Sarah so that he can get by. We're not going to talk about that right now, what that constitutes. But each time, the pagan king rebukes Abraham and Abraham receives it. 
He listens. There's always a million reasons why you can discredit a particular message. Right? You could always say, what does that person know? They lack the expertise. They don't know my circumstances. Who knows? Who cares what they think? Right? There are a billion reasons to discredit a message. But the only one that actually counts, the only one that would actually matter, is if the message itself is wrong. So many of us discredit the message on the basis of the messenger. And that once again shows you, you're not actually open to truth. You're only open to hearing the dictates of your own heart. The truly righteous and virtuous person can hear the voice of the stranger, meaning that they are welcoming to contradiction, even and maybe especially when that contradiction comes from the mouth of an enemy. It's a very hard thing to do, but that is what the truly righteous are able to do. They hear truth wherever it is spoken even when it comes from an unfriendly source. To the one who is not righteous, the one who is walking in foolishness, they would not hear truth even when it comes from the most friendly of sources. Even when it comes from an angel or God himself, they would miss the message because their, their ears are turned off to what would be good for them. Now this is demonstrated in the Bible when God sends prophets who are executed by nations. Which again, sounds weird to us. Why would God send a prophet into a nation that he knows is going to execute them? And we think, like, why wouldn't God just leave the prophet at home? Well, because this is it's exactly what's happening in Genesis 18 and 19. God is proving the depravity of the nation by sending prophets who are subsequently executed. And sometimes these prophets are not even what we would expect. You even think about guys like Socrates, not exactly a hallmark of Judeo-Christian values, Yet Socrates, when he spoke the truth with, without fear in Athens, they forced him to drink hemlock. Every society that moves past the point of saving is the society that will crucify and execute the voice of the stranger that they don't like. So whenever a government starts restricting and oppressing speech that they don't like, that's a bad sign. Because that means that we're turning our ears off to messages that we don't like to hear. Right? It means that we're becoming repressive towards truth, and only accepting of truth that we want to hear. The Bible puts it this way, Proverbs 26, verse 12, Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. At least the ignorant can be corrected. The arrogant cannot. There's a great danger when we, or a culture that we live within, has shut ourselves off to the prophets of our time. God is always sending prophets. Like I said, they don't always look like what you think, but God is always sending prophets to nations. And the nations that accept them and they accept their, nation, their message and change as a result are the ones that could be saved. The ones who reject it are the ones that can't. And believe it or not, God is sending you and me messengers all the time. All the time there are voices speaking to you about the way to go and the way to behave, and the way to walk with the Lord. And whenever we say, like, we want God to speak to us, have you ever considered that He already is? you ever considered that He already is sending you messages that He wants you to heed, and you're not doing it? Now, a lot of us could see this very clearly if we have a conversion story, right? meaning that we came to faith at some point in our life, and we could look back and be like, gosh, how many people did God send into my life to tell me the gospel, and I ignored it? How many people did God actually put in my path to tell me the truth and I didn't listen? If that's true about the truth of the gospel, what makes you think it's not true about other things that God might want you to hear? Other corrections that God wants you to give heed to? If only you have ears to listen. Now, this also has something to do with what we call true virtue, and we've talked a little bit about this, but let me give you another verse to illustrate. James 1, verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. This sounds very odd. Why is pure and undefiled religion not evangelism? Why isn't it prayer? Why isn't it tithing? Reading scripture? Attending church? Why is it specifically loving the stranger? That sounds very strange to us, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't take much imagination. 
Do you realize that all the things that I just said, evangelism, prayer, attending church, studying the scripture, are all things that the Pharisees and the Sadducees did way better than you and I do? Religion, James is not saying that those things are bad, but he's saying that those are very easy to pollute and to pervert. Because religiosity has a type of currency in our world. Meaning those who actually portray themselves as being very religious and spiritually illuminating individuals are those who will receive respect and grandeur from the communities that they live within. Those who offer aid to the stranger get nothing in return for it. Unless they do what the Pharisees did and they actually like ring a, a, a tambourine or something every single time they give. But for the most part, if you give aid to the one who has no power, unless you bring the cameras, no one's going to know about it. They have no voice. They have no power within the society. You give them aid, you give them aid out of your own pocket, and you'll receive nothing in return. Which also means that when we love the stranger, we grow in our love for God and those near us. When we practice loving those outside of ourselves, we are actually practicing this virtue. Practice does make perfect. You cannot grow in your love for others unless you practice loving others when there's nothing in it for you. In fact, this is going to get into how our modern culture has corrupted this message in a second here. But in fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, when Paul is talking about distribution of welfare to widows, he actually says that the church should not give money to widows that have family members. And he gives the reason. He says, so that the family may learn virtue by giving aid to their own family. And he says, he who is denied the family is worse than a non-believer and has denied the faith. You practice the virtue even within your own home, and then as you practice it, you become more and more Christ-like, which leads to the main point. We actually don't live in a pagan nation. We live in a post-Christian nation. What does that mean? It means we're not like the pagan nations that taught that loving your neighbor, that being tribal was a good thing. We live in a nation that actually does believe in the ethic of Christianity, but a perverted version of it. 2 John 1 verse 9 through 11 says this, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. It sounds weird. He's actually telling them not to give hospitality to false teachers, to heretics. There is always such a thing as too much of a good thing. There is always such a thing as an unbalanced virtue. When you give hospitality without competence and discernment, you do bad both to the stranger and to your own home. It is possible to do evil while trying to do good, and many, many people do this. So what's happened in our current culture? Well, in our current culture, we've taken this virtue, this good virtue of hospitality, and we've tried to universalize it. We've tried to make people be hospitable, whether they like it or not. Well, how do we do that? Through taxes, right? So we're like, we don't care if you want to give to the general welfare. We're going to make you give to the general welfare. It comes out of your paycheck whether you like it or not. And we think that that's a good thing. It's a problem. Coursed virtue is not virtue at all. If someone points a gun to your head and tells you to empty out your 401k and give it to the homeless guy on the beach, that doesn't make you a good person if you say yes. Right? That just makes you sane that you want to save your own life. Virtue at the point of a gun is not virtue at all. So, number one, it's making a society that's less hospitable than even the pagan culture. See, we think we're hospitable because we give to these structures. That's the dangerous thing. At least the pagan cultures could be confronted about this and say, like, you don't give aid to strangers. And like, oh, well, yeah, because we're not supposed to. Our culture legitimately thinks that we're virtuous. We're like, look at how many illegals we're welcoming into our country. Look at how virtuous we are. How many of them are you letting into your home? Right? You could preach all you want about how we as a nation should be able to take the load, but until you personally take the load, it's no virtue. It's no virtue. It's deception. It's lies. It's manipulation. It's virtue signaling, which is what we call it. Right? It's not real. The only time it's real is when it becomes real for you. 
then it's real virtue. We have taken off the mask of hospitality and we wear it around as though it's honest and with integrity, but it's not. Beyond that, it's the void of common sense. You have to actually help the stranger. If you do something that hurts the stranger in the name of helping them, guess what? You haven't helped them. So, let me give a, an example. I don't make it very quick. Let's take the homeless issue, for instance. Right, for a while, while I was growing up, there was a lot of panhandling throughout the city. Now there are these nifty signs that have come up everywhere that says, don't give, don't give money to panhandlers. You're like, well, have we shut ourselves off to virtue? Have we shut ourselves off to hospitality? No, because the people who made those signs are not exactly right-wingers, right? The reason why those signs come up is because they realize we're hurting the people we're giving money to and everybody else at the same time. Yeah, I went to a meeting of pastors not too long ago. We were talking about dealing with the homeless issue. And uh, I'm not going to get into the policy procedures that I was against, but in the middle of the conversation, once I gave my two cents, thank God, a pastor right next to me was like, everything this dude is saying is right. <laughs> I was like, thank God. And he's like, I live in this neighborhood, right? We're, we're not in a good area of town. He's like, I live in this neighborhood. He's like, I used to give out free food to homeless people in my neighborhood every night. And you know what happened? They started camping out in my neighborhood. And I had elderly neighbors who were chased out of the neighborhood. Now some of them are homeless because they can't afford anything else. They started graffitiing all over our roads. They started slashing our tires and defecating in our yards. He's like, I thought I was doing them good, but I ended up hurting them and everyone around me. You can think you're doing good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you actually are. Hospitality is something that needs to be trained in integrity and intelligence, not something that you just frivolously do, especially by bloated bureaucratic agencies. Now notice how God recommends it. This is Leviticus 19, verse 9 through 10. So he's talking about how the nation of Israel is supposed to give aid to the stranger. He says this, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of the field, nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not glean your vineyard, nor shall you gather every grape in your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Notice, this is not governmental welfare. This is private. The private landowners are giving away parts of their field to the homeless and the stranger. So that means that the homeless and the stranger actually have to work for the food. They have to actually go work for the food. They can collect it themselves. And it's a bit of a stopgap measure. Because the Bible says that we are created to work. So we're created to do. In 2 Thessalonians 3, Paul has to rebuke the church at Thessalonica for giving aid to people who refuse to work. He says, I don't care if you have the money. He says, if you don't work, you don't eat. That doesn't come from Pocahontas. That's from, John, that's from the Apostle Paul. Right, you don't work, you don't eat. That's the, that's the message. He's like, why? Because we were created to work. What makes you think you're doing someone favors by enabling their laziness? What makes you think that they're having a fulfilling life simply receiving handouts? Would you have a fulfilling life simply receiving handouts? Why do you think you're doing good when you're really doing harm? Now, this is something, by the way, we used to understand as a culture. I always go to fairy tales because they are the language of our, of our nation and our civilization. Beauty and the Beast. What happens at the beginning of the Beauty and the Beast? The rich prince is confronted with a stranger, right? a beautiful enchantress cloaked as a impoverished woman. He turns her away. She curses him as a result of him turning away the stranger. Now, the curse is very interesting. He turns into a beast, and all of his servants turn into objects. Why is that? Because when you're ruled by a narcissist, all you are to them is an object. That's the message. And the only way that he's able to be saved is when he learns to love someone outside of himself and earn their love in return. He was so used to, in his narcissistic little bubble, of thinking that he was just owed love. But when he became a beast, he had to earn it. This is juxtaposed with Gaston, who is the narcissist who wasn't turned into a beast and thinks that he's owed love and affection. And Belle is the protagonist because she's able to see through all that. She sees the evil in Gaston and does not offer him hospitality, but she sees the good in the beast and responds to his advances. And Snow White is another good example. In Snow White, she foolishly invites in the witch to the house, and the witch poisons her with an apple. 
right? So again, we used to know this. The stranger, we're supposed to give aid to the stranger, but not every stranger. Right? Like there's, there is a wisdom there that we're supposed to deal with. And believe me, the backlash is coming. If you want to know where Nazism came from, if you want to know where fascism came from, it was a backlash to exactly this. Cultures that opened the doors wide open to every stranger that they possibly could, and it just started to destroy their nation. And then you have guys like Hitler who ascended to power saying, blood and soil. And everyone started to rally behind them. Right? So you may be inviting in a lot more than you think when you do stuff like that. We need to be, what does Jesus say? Gentle as doves, but wise as serpents. We need to be both. How do we grow in our hospitality? I'll give you three quick ways. Number one, grow in your relationship with God and your appreciation for him. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. We, we become what we behold. The message of the cross is the message of what we call costly grace. That Jesus didn't outsource his virtue. Does that make sense? He didn't hire someone to do good to us. He didn't, he didn't hire someone to go to the cross. Jesus personally went to the cross for us. God became a man. God died on your behalf. If you want to become more like God, study Him. Study the message of the cross and realize that if you want to become a hospitable person, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something personally. It's not just going to be a, a national effort. It's going to be something that you have to subscribe to. And that means that you need to grow in your appreciation for what God has done for you. The person who understands the costly grace that they have received is the person who is ready to give it to others. Next, grow in your community. Also because of this, like I said, people aren't trained in this virtue anymore. Hebrews 10, verse 24 through 25 says this, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Like I said, this virtue is being shielded from us because we've outsourced all of it to the government. Kids used to have to save for their parents' retirement. That might shock you, but that's what kids had to do. Now it's like, well, there's Social Security and homes, Mom and Dad. We got you, you know? That's how people think nowadays. You used to have to provide for someone if they hit hard times, especially a family member. Now it's like, well, there's welfare and unemployment for you. Here's how you sign up for that. It used to cost you to love your family. It used to cost you to love those who were near to you. That's why in Hebrews he's saying, consider one another in order to what? Stir up love and good works. If you want to learn this virtue, you need to be close to people. Because when you get close to people, their weaknesses and difficulties become clear to you and yours becomes clear to them. You can receive help and you can give it in a practical way, an intentional way. Finally, you need to learn how to give aid to strangers. That's the final part of this. And again, this is something that we're all growing in. None of us do this. We're all trying to grow in this together. And it's one of the reasons why at this church we've been emphasizing so much coming together and being close to one another. It's why we have the potluck at the beginning, because we want people to give aid to one another. Right? It's all to grow us in this virtue, which is hard to practice in our current moment. But finally, giving aid to strangers. Proverbs 22, verse 9 he who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he who gives of his bread to the poor. The church is a weird juxtaposition. Jesus says that we are to be fiercely tribal. We are to love one another more than anyone else. The church is supposed to be a city on a hill, right? We are supposed to be this incredibly tribal organization. However, at the same time, the church is to be willing to lay down our lives for the stranger. We are to be both. We are to love the stranger more than ourselves, but we are also to love ourselves. The thing about our current culture is we offer aid to the stranger, but we don't even love ourselves. We don't even love our own nation. There is something that needs to be achieved through both. You must love yourself before you can love your neighbor as yourself. Right? There has to be an affection for your own community before your community can give aid to others, but the community ought to give aid to others. A powerful church is a church that is invested in each other and caring about the needs of the other members within it, but also, also deeply invested in evangelizing the lost. That we care about others outside of ourselves. 
that we share the good news of Jesus Christ to those who are perishing, and we share of our own sustenance to benefit those who are without. That's what we're supposed to be doing together. It's a difficult thing, but that's how we grow in this all-important godly virtue of hospitality. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much, and we're grateful for what you have done for us. You have given us everything, Lord. You have died on our behalf. You have taken our sins away from us as far as the east is from the west, and through your Son we have peace for our souls. I pray, God, that we would learn how to imbibe this quality within ourselves, that we would always be striving to love others as you have loved us, not just with grace and humility, but also with wisdom and discernment. Teach us, Lord God, to do these things. And through your Son we pray. Amen. So as we take a communion, this is a time where we commemorate the giving of the Son of God. Right? We're commemorating his great gift to us, that he gave his very body and his blood that we might become one with him, the most valuable resource in the universe. And as always, I ask you, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have not made him your Lord and Savior, please allow for the elements to pass by. This is a time of actual communion between the people of God and their Lord. But if you have a relationship with God, the elements are open up to you. And if you want to know more about having a relationship with God, please approach myself or one of the other elders after the service. Let's meditate on this passage. Philippians 2, verse 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, even to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him above, him, uh, above and given him the name which is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father.